So in the last module, we surveyed some of the significant historical developments in the study of logic. In this module, we are going to take a big picture approach. That is, we're going to try to get a general idea of what to expect in this course and where all we are going to go in the weeks ahead by considering in this module a general overview of logic as a discipline and also some of the important things to consider when approaching and analyzing effective logic and language. We will identify different modes of reasoning, consider the basic anatomy, so to speak, of an argument, and we will distinguish between good and problematic arguments. We will also consider three different appeals to persuasion, and we will study one effective model for developing an argument or analyzing the arguments of another. So let us begin in good philosophical fashion with terminology and a clarification of our terms. There are three general approaches to reasoning. When we start with what we already know is the case, uh, a general rule that applies to most things, that is a universal concept, and we try to bring that down to make sense of a particular thing or to answer a particular question, this is deductive reasoning, arguing from the universal to the particular or from the general rule to the particular case. So when we argue all men are mortal, Socrates is a man, therefore Socrates must be mortal, this is a classic deductive method. When we engage in scientific observation, however, we start with the thing that's right before us, that which is in our immediate sense experience, the particular case, and we take note of it. And then when we observe another case, we take note of that as well. And the idea behind the enterprise of science is to try to collect enough data from a series of particular cases or from the results of this study coupled with the results of that study. And then you put the particular cases together in order to try to grasp some sense of a general rule. That is, we start with the particulars and work our way towards what we think to be the universal. We start with the case and work our way toward the generalization. And finally, there's abductive reasoning. Whereas induction takes a series of cases and tries to work toward a generalizable rule, abduction involves a situation in which we take the evidence that we have and try to um, work our way to the best explanation for that evidence. If we witness two of our friends that were dating have a huge fight and break up declaring they never want to see each other again, and then a few days later we see the two of them jogging together and enjoying one another's company, we would not conclude a generalizable rule that whenever two people break up, later they will go jogging together. Rather, in this situation, since we observed the one case where they broke up and then we observed the one case that they were running together, we might draw an inference to the most likely explanation, that is, they work things out. Another example that shows up in philosophy or religion involves the debate or arguments over the possibility of miracles. If you are arguing that a miracle has occurred, for example, the resurrection of Jesus, we have to understand up front that miracles are not naturals. So when we speak of natural law or things like this, uh, the, our methods of scientific investigation and induction, we have a series of cases, a number of cases that have uh, a uniformity and from that we draw out generalizable rules like certain natural laws. And then if we have on the table, this is what's in question, the possibility that something has occurred which does not fit our expectations based upon our universalized principles, then the appeal to a generalized expectation, a generalizable principle, in itself is not really going to solve the question on the table. Rather, we have to look at the evidence that's put on the table for and against the possibility of this particular case and then make an inference to the best possible explanation. 
That's abductive reasoning. In the words of Sherlock Holmes, when you have eliminated the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth. Now, logic and rhetoric go hand in hand. Logic has to do with our reasoning, and rhetoric has to do with our persuasion or the art of speaking. In addition to thinking well, we have to communicate well. And when our thinking is about an argument, not only do we have to think well about the argument and make sure our ideas are leading to conclusions, we also then, even if we think really well or we understand the argument, we have to convince others. So when we try to convince others through our language, we have to make certain appeals in order to attempt to persuade others to see things our way, to buy what we are selling. Aristotle observed that there are three principles of persuasion. The first is ethos, which is related to the word ethics, which is related to the idea, especially for Aristotle, of character. So whenever I speak, if I'm trying to persuade you of something, whether or not you believe me will in part depend upon whether or not you believe me to be credible. And this may also involve whether or not you believe me to be trustworthy or a certain caliber of character. Consider your encounter with a door-to-door -door salesman. If someone comes to your home and they're trying to sell you something, you already know that there's something in it for them, right? So what is the real intent? What reason do you have to believe that they have your best interests at heart and they're not really simply trying to meet a quota or make a sale? The second principle of persuasion is really where logic meets rhetoric, and this is logos. Logos has to do with the appeal to reasoning. Are you presenting a coherent and compelling line of reasoning? Do the examples you give or the evidences you offer lead clearly to the assertions you are trying to make or the ideas you are trying to sell? The final and most powerful approach to persuasion is through pathos. Pathos is an appeal to emotion, which has a sort of experiential, unspoken logic, it seems, and sort of existential knowing. We know some things by living through. It is not an appeal to rational knowledge and a, a logical, this is the case, therefore this is the case. Rather, it is an appeal to what we seem to believe at some foundational level because of what we have felt or experienced in our living through day-to-day -day situations. So one might give rational, uh, deductive proofs for the existence of objective moral truths, that there are certain ways we ought to act and certain things we should not do. But if someone is not convinced by the propositional argument involving ethics, we might instead make an appeal to, for example, self-interest. Well, would you want anyone to do that to you? Or we may pick a situation that seems to be emotionally charged or most people, the majority of people, would react negatively against in order to ask if that's okay. If it's the case that there is no right or wrong, no way that we ought to act or ought not to act, then this would mean there's nothing wrong with raping someone, or slavery is not wrong, it's not uh, unjust. Um, this would also mean that people like Martin Luther King were not good, they just lived their truth. And people like Hitler were not bad, he just lived his truth. Those sorts of issues resonate with us as, wait a minute, something's not right about that. Even if the logical proposition didn't speak to us, the majority of people recognize that it's not okay to torture innocent babies for the fun of it. This is an appeal to our emotional intelligence acquired from our lived experience. Now, when we analyze the logic of our thinking and also our means of persuasion, 
Sometimes we have good arguments or good appeals, and sometimes we have problematic arguments or appeals, and those we call fallacies. Now, there are a number of ways to appeal appropriately to ethos, pathos, and logos, but there are also abuses and fallacious appeals that might take place. Just one example of an appropriate appeal to ethos might be a, a scholar in academic writing, publishing an academic essay. It's standard to begin with what we call the review of literature. Before you say what you have to say, you establish what has already been said in the field, generally speaking. Now, although this is a reference to scholars other than the author, what the author is doing implicitly here is establishing their credibility as a scholar. They're demonstrating that they're not just uh, ignoring what's been said and coming to say what they want to say. Rather, they are recognizing the different uh, perspectives that have gone before them. And in doing so, they are establishing, upping their creds, if you will, as a scholar. There are also explicit ways to establish credibility with the audience, and these may not always come from the speaker, him or herself. Uh, often it's the case when someone's giving a speech that they are introduced, and when they are introduced, all of the information about them, a short bio of what they've accomplished or what their degrees are, etc., are provided so that we have some concept of who it is that's about to speak to us and what is their authority to speak. There are also fallacious ways to appeal to character. And these usually come in the form of appealing to the character of others. So when we take issue with someone, rather than taking issue with what they've said or the argument they've put on the table, we might give the audience reasons to not like that person or to try to discredit them as a scholar in front of the eyes of the audience. Now, this is a fallacious move. We'll look at this later. But a good scholar will deal with the arguments and not attack the person. But someone who's abusing the appeal to ethos may avoid the actual conversation or the argument on the table and instead take shots at the other person. We see this a lot in politics, don't we, when it's time for an election. Usually if there's a problem in the delivery of our logic, the rhetoric, then it probably comes down to some form of terminology or ambiguity, lack of clarity, or we fail to establish our grounding or to make the clear connections from our premises to our conclusion. But if there's a problem with our actual reasoning, it's not really an issue with the rhetoric per se, but with the logic proper. And we will spend much of the course focusing on good logic and logical fallacies. Now, in the same way that we said the appeal to pathos was so powerful and might help us to drive our point home at times when cold propositions just don't seem to resonate with our audience, so too fallacious appeals to pathos can be extremely powerful, which is a problem. So when a speaker is trying to appeal more to the heartstrings of the person rather than to reason, or if they make an effective appeal to the emotions of someone, but they are trying to persuade someone to agree to an idea which may lie contrary to logic, that's an issue. If someone is on trial for killing someone in their neighborhood and the defense lawyer is making an appeal to pity because this person has grown up an orphan without their parents, living in an impoverished area with no one to really mentor them and they've had it so hard and they're really a good person that just was in the wrong place at the wrong time, running with the wrong crowd because they were the only community the defendant knew. And so we should not hold the defendant accountable for his decisions, which were influenced so greatly by his context and upbringing. Now, 
although some of these things may be uh, variables we need to consider, and context often reveals important information for a jury to consider. In this case, the real question is whether it is morally permissible to take the life of another person. And the argument that's being given is not really speaking to, yes, it is permissible to take a life. Rather, it's a sort of sleight of hand, don't look at that, look at how bad the conditions were for this person. We should feel sorry for them. Now again, there are times to consider the context, and it may well be that this was a good kid who just happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. And perhaps we should consider uh, whether there's something good about giving second chances and lessening uh, the severity of a punishment. So if the defense is trying to make this kind of move in order to try to persuade the jury not to give as severe a consequence as they could, perhaps that's okay. But if the attempt is to try to focus on pity rather than the real question at hand, did the defendant murder someone, is murder permissible, then there's a problem. Okay, now let's look at some terminology specific to the structure of an argument. Arguments include premises and conclusions. A premise is a statement used as evidence for a conclusion. A conclusion is a statement that is supported by the premises and expected to follow from the premises. Now, an assertion in and of itself is not an argument. And so a conclusion cannot simply be an assertion. You've got to at least have one idea that is expected to lead to that assertion. So minimally, technically, an argument can consist of a conclusion or an assertion that is supported by at least one accompanying premise. However, good arguments always contain at least two premises because it's rarely going to be the case, unless we're dealing with self-evident truths, it's rarely going to be the case that one premise will lead necessarily to a conclusion. So usually you have to begin with one premise upon which we agree and then insert an additional premise that will then force us to the conclusion. A proposition is a statement that is either true or false. It's a statement about the world such as that door is brown or David Hume was a bachelor or Fido is Joe's mother. Recall from module one that the problem that Bertrand Russell was taking up was built upon this foundational idea that all propositions that are meaningful assertions about the world must be either true or false. And so we looked at the assertion, there is a unicorn in my garden, and if that's true, then unicorns exist. If it's false, it does not exist, at least the one in my garden. And then we considered a different proposition. The unicorn in my garden is purple. Now, if that's true, then the unicorn in my garden is purple. But if we deny that, if we negate it, if it's false, then the unicorn in my garden still exists, but it's not purple. And so because all propositions give you a statement that is true or false, and yet we often attach a number of predicates and adjectives to our subjects. Russell was specifically interested in how we can reformulate our language so that despite all the things that we attach to the subject whose existence is in question, we can reformulate a simple proposition such that we can say, yes, such an X exists or no, such a thing does not exist. If it's an assertion about the world, and yet it is not a proposition, clearly true or false, then it is a non-propositional utterance. A verbal expression that may convey meaning, but it cannot be clearly true or false about the world. 
Keep your dog out of my yard. This conveys meaning. We, it's clear what the speaker intends. However, as it is formulated, it is not a proposition. It's neither true or false about the world. It's just a command. If we reformulate the command, you better keep your dog out of my yard, which implies or else, now we have a proposition. It's either true that you had better keep your dog out of my yard or not. And it might also be true that you will face a consequence if your dog is in my yard again. Now, because our language is often messy and not always presented neatly, we need to learn to look for certain clues. A premise or conclusion indicator is a clue word which signals that a premise or conclusion follows. For example, take the assertion, a trumpet is not a stringed instrument since a trumpet doesn't have any strings. In this case, since is a premise indicator. A trumpet is not a stringed instrument is the conclusion, and since indicates that my premise is that the trumpet doesn't have any strings. Therefore, it's not a stringed instrument. A guitar has strings. Therefore, a guitar is a stringed instrument. Now, in this case, therefore functions as a conclusion indicator. A guitar has strings. That's my premise. Therefore, my conclusion, a guitar is a stringed instrument. Once we can identify premises and conclusions, we need to determine how the premises are intended to lead us to the conclusions. And here it may be helpful to draw out or visualize diagrams of our arguments. An argument diagram uses arrows and plus symbols to reveal an argument's structure. Consider the following example. The pipa is a musical instrument from China, and it has strings. For this reason, it is a stringed musical instrument. So the argument structure is as follows. The pipa is an object that has strings. The pipa is a musical instrument from China. It is a stringed musical instrument. So the first two premises are combined, and the third statement is the conclusion. So we might diagram it by thinking of one, premise one, plus, or the conjoining, and premise two, one and two taken together, lead us to, you can use an arrow sign here, the third statement. The first and second statement lead us to the third statement. This is what we call a joint inference. Each premise alone tells us only part of what is concluded. So both pieces of information taken together, one plus two, are needed in order to draw the conclusion. Contrast that with this example. A typical trumpet is made of brass. The Harvard Dictionary of Music classifies the trumpet as a brass instrument. Thus the trumpet is a brass instrument. In this case, the first piece of information a typical trumpet is made of brass, can lead us to the conclusion that the trumpet is a brass instrument. And the second line of evidence, the Harvard Dictionary of Music says the trumpet is a brass instrument, can also lead us to the conclusion that the trumpet is a brass instrument. So the first premise leads to the conclusion and the second leads to the conclusion. So our diagram would have one arrow three, or one leads to three and Conjoining, two leads to three. This is called an independent inference since each premise in itself is able to lead to the same conclusion. Now once we get to module eight, we will look more closely and in greater detail at some of the particular types of fallacies, both formal and informal. But for this module, module two, our main goal is to understand and identify some of the most common forms of fallacies. But once again, we should clarify our terminology. A fallacy is any error in reasoning that makes an argument flawed. Aristotle wrote fallacies of the sophists in order to identify several fallacious patterns of reasoning. Fallacies can be both informal or formal. In short, a formal fallacy is a problem with our form or structure of our argument and an informal fallacy is a problem with anything else. Fallacies of relevance are situations in which the conclusion simply does not follow from the premises. 
The premises of an argument are irrelevant for establishing the conclusion. These include the ad hominem or the argument against the person in which we attack a person's character instead of dealing with the quality of argument they have put on the table. An argument from ignorance or ad ignorantium argues that something must be true because you can't prove it's not. You may have recognized the ad hominem as a fallacious appeal to ethos. Next is the fallacious appeal to pathos. If someone appeals to a person's unfortunate circumstances in order to get someone to accept a particular conclusion, for example, please don't arrest me, I have a wife and kids to support, they have committed the fallacy of ad misericordium, or the appeal to pity. In addition to the ad misericordium and the ad hominem, the next most common uh, fallacy of relevance is the argumentum ad populum, or the appeal to the masses, going along with the crowd in support of a conclusion, or arguing that you ought to buy into a particular view or idea or position or ideology because everyone else does, or the majority of people do. Of course, if the question on the table is an ethical challenge that the popular view in vogue of the time or the, the main narrative that a culture is teaching is wrong or even immoral. If the challenge on the table is that the majority sees things wrongly, then it is a fallacious move to point to the majority and say, no, we see things correctly. See, everyone agrees. This ties well into the next fallacy. The ad populum is essentially establishing authority amongst the masses. But sometimes we may attempt to establish authority in a particular figure who is not an authority in that area or on that issue. They may have ideas and assertions about the topic, but they're not an established credible authority on that topic. This is a problem many students fall into when writing their academic essays. Uh, if you're writing a research term paper and you cite uh, authorities, but they're from a different field than the subject matter you are addressing in your term paper, that's not a good authority. Or what about products that say, doctor recommended? Well, do you just go off of that information, or should we ask deeper questions? For example, how many doctors? You only have to have one doctor recommend something in order to call it doctor recommended. But actually, a doctor of what? A PhD is a doctor, an MD is a doctor, a doctor of veterinary sciences, a doctor of psychology, a doctor of education. These are all doctors. So technically, you could have someone who is a doctor of education endorse a product and call it, quote, doctor recommended. Finally, we have the non sequitur. This is simply what we call it when it's an irrelevant conclusion, but it doesn't make any of these other particular moves. It's not irrelevant because it's attacking a person or appealing to pity or appealing to ignorance or appealing to the authority of a particular person or the popular vote. Rather, it's irrelevant because it simply does not follow. My shoes hurt, therefore it's going to rain. Other fallacies fall into different categories, but here are some of the most common fallacies that you will encounter. The post hoc ergo proctor hoc, or that, therefore this, also known as the false cause fallacy, involves inferring a causal connection based on mere correlation. For example, successful people have expensive clothing, hence the best way to become a success is to buy expensive clothing. Circular reasoning is where you implicitly use your conclusion as a premise. A is true because B is true. B is true because A is true. These must be primitive fossils because they were found in old rocks. Well, how do you know the rocks are so old? Because they have primitive fossils in them. By the way, just a sidebar, FYI, circular reasoning is often called begging the question or question begging. 
Now, people commonly, mistakenly, use the phrase, which begs the question, when they really mean something like, which raises the question. But when you say something begs the question, you are accusing it of involving circular reasoning. So be careful and use that phrase properly. Equivocation occurs when an argument is based on two definitions of one word. And so there's an exchange of terminology amidst the language. Good steaks are rare these days, so you shouldn't order yours well done. Composition and division go together. The fallacy of composition is when you assume that the whole must have the same properties of its parts. And division occurs when you assume that the parts of a whole must have the same properties as the whole. An example of composition would be to say each part of this machine is light, therefore the whole machine must be light. And an example of division would be to say the whole machine is heavy, therefore each individual part of this machine must also be heavy. A red herring is when you introduce some other irrelevant subject and divert attention away from the main subject. So if we argue, seat belts in cars do not really increase safety. Besides, it's my business, not the government's, how I choose to sit in my car. The real issue here is seat belt safety. The issue of individual rights and government intrusions is a diversion. Deal with the issue at hand and deal with a different issue at a different time. And finally, perhaps the most popular on this list is the straw man fallacy. This is when you distort an opposing view so that it's easy to refute. The idea of the straw man is that you're not building a real uh, depiction of the man, but just a sort of a straw man caricature, a, a sort of mere representation of an argument. This is easier to burn down. For example, to argue pro-lifers believe a woman should never have an abortion, even if her life is in danger. Therefore, clearly the pro-life position on abortion is wrong. Even if this accurately reflects the view of some people out there, this is not what many people who advocate for life and against abortion believe. And so it is a straw man fallacy. Now, one of the core parts of logic involves propositional analysis. Remember, a proposition is an assertion about the world that is either true or false. Propositional logic, also called sentential logic, helps us to build arguments which fit certain predetermined valid forms. That is, there are certain forms of arguing that if you use them correctly should always lead to uh, the given conclusion. Now, it's still possible, even if you have a valid argument, a good argument, that it is false if one of your premises turns out to be false, but it can be valid nonetheless. That is, as long as the premises, if they're true, or if they could be true, clearly would lead to that conclusion, then you have a good argument. Now, if the conclusion does not follow from the premises because there is a problem in the formal structure of the argument itself, this is what we call a formal fallacy. So first, let's make sure we have a basic understanding of propositional logic, and of course, we will go more deeply into this in future modules. So all good arguments have at least two premises that lead to a conclusion, and if the argument is formulated well, the first premise, when coupled with the second premise, should lead us, should force us logically to the conclusion. It should clearly follow. For example, premise one, if David Hume was a bachelor, then he was unmarried. Premise two, David Hume was a bachelor. If premise two is true and premise one is the case, then we necessarily have to conclude David Hume was unmarried. The logical form or structure of this argument looks like this. If P, then Q. P, meaning that P is true, proposition P is true, therefore Q, meaning that therefore proposition Q is true. 
Now, within the system of propositional logic, there are four and only four basic logical connectives that are used to construct complex propositions from simpler ones. Conjunction or conjoining, putting things together, and, for example, P and Q. Bob is rich, P. Joe is poor, Q. Both of these are true, so we can conjoin them. P is true and Q is true. It is true that Bob is rich and Joe is poor. So the first connective is the conjunction, and. The second is the disjunction, or. P or Q. Now in this case, if I assert P or Q is the case, then that would mean Bob is rich or Joe is poor. But we don't have reason to believe both. We have reason to believe that one or the other is true, but we cannot conclude the conjunction. So we have the conjunction, P and Q, the disjunction, P or Q. Then we have negation. If P stands for proposition P is true, then not P means it's not the case that proposition P is true. And finally, we have the very important conditional. When you are negotiating and you say, I will agree to this on one condition, what you're saying is, if you meet this requirement, then I will agree to this. So this is the conditional. If P, then Q. Let P stand for, you study well for this class. That's either true or false. And let Q stand for, you will do well in this class. That's either true or false. So the conditional if P then Q means if you study well in this class, then you will do well in this class. Now the conditional can be stated in a number of ways. If P, it follows that Q. P implies Q. P entails Q. Whenever P, Q. Whenever P is the case, Q is the case. Or P is the case, therefore Q is the case. You could even say Q follows from P. Or Q is the case since or because P is the case. Now there are a number of valid forms that we will look at in this course, but here are some of the most common. And when I say valid form, what I mean is that these forms always work. And if you use them correctly and plug in the information appropriately, then the conclusion should always follow from the premises given. Perhaps the most common and arguably the most important is the modus ponens, which we've already seen. If P, then Q. P, therefore Q. The modus tollens is the inverse of this. Both modus ponens and modus tollens begin with if P, then Q. Modus ponens is arguing from P to Q, whereas modus tollens is trying to argue from a negation of Q to a negation of P. Yes, it's true that if P is the case, then Q must be the case. However, we have reason to believe that Q is not the case. This casts doubt on P. Now, we probably use disjunctive syllogisms all the time, but without recognizing it. The disjunctive syllogism says P is true or Q is true, but P is not true. Therefore, Q must be true. So if we have two alternatives, this or that, and we have reason to believe that this is not true, then premise one, this or that, must be true, tells us that the alternative must be the case. If someone asks you how you did on your philosophy test and you say, well, I feel really good about it. I think I got everything right, except there's one question that I'm just not sure about. So either I made a 100 or I only missed one question. And then later when you get home, you check your work and you find out that you got that question right. Now you might conclude that most likely you made a 100. The hypothetical syllogism has this form. If P is true, then Q is true. If Q is true, then R is true. Therefore, if P is true, then R is true. If I am taking a course in ethics, then I am taking a philosophy course. And if I am taking a philosophy course, then I am taking 
one of the humanities courses. Therefore, if I am taking a course in ethics, I am taking one of the humanities courses. Now, to spot a formal fallacy, we have to have a good understanding of how the form is supposed to work. And when we do not follow the logical form as it is meant to flow, then we have a problem with our formal arrangement of the argument we are trying to make. Recall when I introduced the modus ponens, modus tollens, I stressed the importance of understanding the directional flow of each one. If P, then Q. Reading from left to right, P, right arrow, Q. If we flow in that direction, from P to the right, to conclude Q, if we argue in that direction properly, that is moving from the P to the Q, then we have a modus ponens. But if we try to argue from the Q to the P, we have a fallacy called the fallacy of affirming the consequent. So in a conditional, if P then Q, the P is the antecedent, that which comes before, and the Q is the consequent, or the consequence of what came before. We begin with the statement, if P is true, then Q is true. So if we prove P, Q necessarily follows. There is nothing in the statement, if P is true, then Q is true, that implies if Q is true, then P is true. Let P stand for the proposition, Bob climbed up the police radio tower. And let Q stand for the proposition, Bob gets arrested. So if it's the case that Bob climbs up the police radio tower, then Bob gets arrested. If we show that Bob did it, then we have reason to believe Bob will get arrested. However, if this is all that we have to go on, that if Bob climbs, he gets arrested, and we find out that Bob is arrested, do we have the information to conclude that he must have climbed the tower? Is that the only reason he might get arrested? So in this case, we affirmed the consequent. We affirmed Q rather than affirming P in order to move to the conclusion that Q. Now recall the modus tollens. We begin again with if P then Q. The modus tollens uses negation, but it has to work in the opposite order. If we argue from P to Q, we are working toward the right. If we argue with negation, we have to begin by establishing that Q is not the case in order to then, moving to the left, conclude that P is not the case. When we don't follow this proper direction or proper flow of the form, then we end up with another fallacy called denying the antecedent. If we have reason to believe that if Bob climbs the police tower, he will get arrested, then if he climbs, he will get arrested. That follows, but it does not follow that if he does not climb, he will not get arrested. For there are a number of other reasons for which he might be arrested. Now it might be important here to remind you that we're speaking of validity and not necessarily soundness. A valid argument is one that follows. The conclusion follows from the premises as given. This is not the same as a sound argument. A sound argument is one in which it's valid, the conclusion follows, and all the premises are true. So it may indeed be the case that premise one, in this case, is not true. It may be the case that Bob knows how to climb the tower without getting caught. And so it might be the case that he is not arrested and yet he climbs. That's an issue of soundness. But as far as validity goes, if we accept the premise, if he climbs, then he will get arrested. Then the question is what follows from that premise? If we have reason to believe and accept premise one, then if we establish P, Q follows. And if we have reason to doubt Q, then we have reason to doubt P. But we cannot simply assert Q as true and try to plug it into a modus ponens. And we cannot simply assert that P is not the case and try to plug that into a modus tollens. Either way, you get a fallacy. Next, we have the fallacious disjunctive syllogism, also called the fallacy of asserting an alternative. Now, the problem here is that in logic, or 
can be inclusive. We often tend to think either or, and that may be the case. In the example I gave earlier, I can't both have a 100 and have missed a question on the test. So in that case, to argue I got a 100 or I only missed one is asserting an either or. However, logically, statements don't have to work that way. If you were trying to decide whether or not I own an animal, then the premise might be he owns a dog or he does not. It's an either or. However, you might have reason to believe that I do own an animal, but you are not sure what sort. And so you might have the premise he owns a dog or he owns a cat. Now in this case, if you have reason to believe that I own a dog, does it follow necessarily that I do not also own a cat? Or have you only established that I have a dog? So the disjunctive syllogism in its genuine form begins with this or that and has reason to believe that one of those things is not the case and therefore it's left with an assertion of the other thing. It cannot begin with this or that and upon asserting that one of them is the case, necessarily rule out the other. I have a cat or I have a dog. It's not the case that I have a cat, so it is the case I have a dog. That's what I'm left with, in other words. But to argue, I have a cat or I have a dog, I do have a cat, therefore I don't have a dog, is fallacious because it might be correct, but it might not. And remember, what makes one of these valid forms valid forms is that you should be able to plug into this form and always get a conclusion that follows. Now let's think a little more about this distinction between valid and sound. Now forming our argument, that is developing an argument with a valid form where the conclusion should always follow, that's the first step. Validity is really important, but more is needed than just having a valid argument. The best kind of argument must be valid, but also have all true premises. Once we have validity and veracity, or truthful propositions, then we have soundness. Now sometimes you'll hear people call an argument sound when they just mean a valid argument. But soundness means something different. It means that not only is it valid, all the premises are true. Consider the following argument. Uncle George is a golfing shoe, or Uncle George is a tennis shoe. It is not the case that Uncle George is a golfing shoe. Therefore, Uncle George is a tennis shoe. Now this is a valid argument because the conclusion follows from the premises. It's also a deductive argument because the conclusion necessarily follows. This is just to remind you of the distinction we've made between deductive and inductive. Inductive begins with the uh, cases and argues toward greater uh, degrees of likelihood or probability, but cannot speak to what necessarily must be the case. With deductive reasoning, we have certain premises and we are arguing that a certain conclusion necessarily must follow. And yet there's a glaring problem, isn't there? It's simply not the case that Uncle George is a shoe, be it a golfing or tennis shoe. So here we have a valid argument. The conclusion follows from the premises. However, the premises are simply not true. Therefore, the argument is valid, but it is unsound. Now, the argument forms of propositional logic are just one type of deductive logical system. And it only became the dominant system and primary approach to logic beginning in the 20th century. But for most of history, the primary approach to deductive logic was categorical syllogistic logic developed by Aristotle. For example, all human beings are mortal things. Socrates is a human being. Therefore, Socrates is a mortal thing. The categorical syllogism is all about categories of things and how some categories are contained within other categories. Imagine a circle labeled human beings. Inside one 
labeled mortal things. Now place Socrates within the circle labeled human beings. Obviously, Socrates exists within the circle labeled mortal things. The conclusion follows from the two premises with necessity. So here we are thinking less about valid forms of given propositions and more about overlapping categories. We will look more deeply into categorical logic in Module 9. In Module 11, we will transition from more of a deductive approach to focus more on the inductive approach to logic. Both propositional logic and syllogistic or categorical logic are deductive systems, since their conclusions necessarily follow from the premises. But inductive logic takes a completely different approach. The conclusion is likely to be true, but it does not follow from the premises with absolute necessity. So induction is all about probability and not necessity. So an inductive argument is an argument in which the premises provide reasons supporting the probable truth of the conclusion. Premise 1. Rock 1 falls to the ground when I open my hand. Premise 2. Rock 2 falls to the ground when I open my hand. Therefore, all rocks similar to 1 and 2 will probably fall to the ground when I open my hand. Conclusions about cause and effect trade on probability, which is why induction is most often connected with scientific experimentation. As we saw, with deductive arguments, validity is the key concept. An argument is either valid or invalid. There is no in-between. With induction, however, the concept of validity makes no sense. Induction is all about the probability of a conclusion, not its necessity. Inductive arguments use a different standard than inductive probability. The degree to which a conclusion is probable given the truth of the premises. So instead of valid, invalid, we speak of an argument as strong or weak. And whereas deductive reasoning can speak of soundness, inductive reasoning cannot. At best, inductive reasoning can only speak of cogency. That is, whether and to what extent the evidence seems compelling. Now, in determining cogency, there are four degrees of strength to consider. If something is inductively very strong, its probability is close to certain, perhaps as close as we can get. If it is not very strong, but it is strong, then we mean it has a high probability. Something that is inductively weak means it has a low probability, and if it is inductively very weak, then its probability is close to non-existent. So another way to think of these four degrees of strength would be highly likely, likely, unlikely, highly unlikely. So let's look at three common inductive forms and some fallacies associated with each one. First, we have the statistical syllogism, drawing a conclusion about an individual based on the population as a whole. Premise one, n percent of a population has attribute A. X is a member of that population, Therefore, there is an n probability that x has a. This number of people have this attribute. This person is a member of that population. Therefore, this is the probability that this person has that attribute. 36% of Americans ages 18 to 24 have tattoos. Joe is an American within that age range. Therefore, there is a low probability that Joe has a tattoo. So the fallacy of small proportion is when a conclusion is too strong to be supported by the small population portion. If we tried to argue that there is a strong probability that Joe has a tattoo, then we miss the fact that our sample only accounts for 36% of Joe's demographic. A statistical induction is when we draw a conclusion about a population based on a sample. For example, n percent of this sample has attribute A. Therefore, n percent of a population 
probably has attribute A. 27% of 1,033 randomly surveyed adults believe that God helps decide who wins sporting events. Therefore, 27% of the population probably believes that God helps decide who wins sporting events. Now remember, inductive reasoning can only argue from a number of cases toward a generalizable conclusion. The question is, always the question for science, how many cases is enough to draw the conclusions we're trying to draw? So if our sample size or our number of case studies is too low to really get the sort of uh, evidence or data to back the kind of claim we're trying to make, we have a problem. So a fallacy of small sample is when the conclusion is too strong to be supported by such a small sample number. In this case, the issue rests on what an appropriate size sample should be for a study. If we only randomly survey a number that is much smaller than what is typically considered acceptable or appropriate for the given sort of research in a given field, then the margin of error will be too high to reliably support our conclusion. In the case of the fallacy of biased sample, a conclusion is too strong to be supported by a non-random sampling technique. In this case, the issue involves the non-random nature of selecting our sample. If our data that 27% of 1,033 randomly surveyed adults believe that God helps decide who wins sporting events comes solely from an organization called the Association of Religious Sports Fanatics who meet regularly to talk about how God wins our daily victories and you name it, you claim it, whatever you pray for, you receive. This cannot really reliably represent a randomized sample of the whole population. Another common inductive argument form is the argument from analogy. Here we draw a conclusion about one individual based on its similarities with another individual. For example, premise one, objects X and Y each have the attributes A, B, and C. Object X has an additional attribute, D. Therefore, object Y probably also has the additional attribute, D. So one might argue, humans and chimpanzees each have pain receptors, neurological pain pathways within their brains, and natural painkillers. Humans consciously experience pain, therefore chimpanzees probably also consciously experience pain. This is an argument from analogy. Now, a false analogy occurs when we compare two items that have trivial points in common but they differ from each other in more significant ways. Suppose we say humans and store mannequins both have human form, stand upright, and wear clothes. Humans consciously experience pain, therefore store mannequins probably also consciously experience pain. In this case, both premises one and two may be true. However, the attributes listed in premise one are irrelevant to the ability to experience pain. And the last thing I want you to think about in this module is a method for analyzing arguments that comes from the philosopher Stephen Tolman. The Tolman model is helpful in that it works well when there are no obvious conclusions or clear solutions to a problem. It takes into account the fact that most situations are complex involving a number of variables to consider. In his book called The Uses of Argument, he presents six elements for argument analysis, and these can really help you as both a reader and a writer. When analyzing arguments, look for these elements to help you see and evaluate the argument more clearly. When writing an argument, include these elements purposefully so that your audience may see the validity of your claims. These six elements are claims, grounds, warrant, backing, qualifier, and rebuttal. The claim is a statement of opinion that the author is asking her or his audience to accept as true. 
For example, there should be more laws to regulate texting while driving in order to cut down on dangerous car accidents. The grounds are the facts, data, or reasoning upon which the claim is based. Essentially, the grounds are the facts making the case for the claim. The National Safety Council estimates that 1.6 million car accidents per year are caused by cell phone use and texting. The warrant is what links the ground to the claim. This is what makes the audience understand how the grounds are connected to supporting the claim. Now, sometimes the warrant is implicit, it's implied and not directly stated, but the warrant can be stated directly as well. Being distracted by texting on a cell phone while driving a car is dangerous and causes accidents. This links the grounds concerning the number of annually reported car accidents connected to cell phone use and texting to the claim that there should be more laws regulating texting while driving in order to cut down on dangerous car accidents. The backing gives additional support for the claim by addressing different questions relating to your claim. For example, with greater fines and more education about the consequences, people might think twice about texting and driving. The qualifier is essentially the limits to the claim or an understanding that the claim is not true in all situations. Qualifiers add strength to claims because they help the audience to understand the author does not expect his or her opinion to be true of all cases all the time. If writers use qualifiers that are too broad, such as always or never, their claims can be really difficult to support. Qualifiers like some or many help limit the claim, which can add strength to the claim. So continuing with the given example about car accidents, one might say, there should be more laws to regulate texting while driving in order to cut down on some of the dangerous car accidents that happen each year. So here, they are not stating what some of the extreme consequences should be, but just saying something more needs to happen. And also, they are acknowledging that dangerous car accidents can happen annually for a number of reasons. But this would seem to help with that some. And finally, the rebuttal is when the author addresses the opposing views, the naysayers, considers the critics. The author can use a rebuttal as a preemptive counter acknowledging, even expecting, certain criticisms or challenges and providing a counter-argument before the challenge even arises. This actually makes the original argument much stronger as it demonstrates the author has thought not only about their own perspective, but they've also thought well about the perspective of others in order to recognize potential challenges and demonstrate a readiness to respond to them. So in our example on texting while driving, a rebuttal might look like this. Although police officers are busy already, making anti-texting laws a priority saves time, money, and lives. Local departments could add extra staff to address this important priority. So here they are expecting the challenge that police officers already have so much other stuff to deal with. Why should they have to worry about this also? and they are taking the time to go ahead and recognize and answer that challenge while making their case. This is the end of module two. In this module, we took a big picture bird's eye view of where all we are going to go in the weeks ahead. We will look at logical propositional analysis. We will look at uh, logical fallacies, both formal and informal. We will look at categorical logic, and we will look at inductive logic as well. Much of the information presented in this module has come from the work of James Fieser. Dr. Fieser is a professor of philosophy at the University of Tennessee at Martin and an editor for the Internet Encyclopedia of Philosophy. Much of the information in this module comes from one of his open access, open education resources called Great Issues in Philosophy. In the next module, module three, we will look more closely at identifying arguments and argument structures. And this will include a closer inspection of premise indicators, conclusion indicators, and argument diagrams.